my discourse today to the keepers of the flame from the personal level with the invitation to my divine presence to speak is based on the subject of transition or what mankind calls death. Inasmuch as we are all celebrating the feast of the resurrection, it is altogether fitting and proper that the mysteries of life, which seem to have their terminus in death, should be pondered and considered by us here and now. I think that re-embodiment or the transition of the soul from one human consciousness into a flesh form again as a little child is clearly recognized by us and I do not intend to go into re-embodiment as such today. I am concerned, however, with speaking to some degree on the transition of man from the human level because it is an experience which we all have passed through again and again and again, even as we have passed through the birth process again and again. There is no need to fear death because it is a natural phenomena and we must understand that it is no more difficult unless we make it so than simply going to sleep at night. In fact, you die quicker than you go to sleep. It's just one last breath and the loss of consciousness and the soft velvety darkness that seems to surround you for one moment and there's no more consciousness. But transition is not always quite that way. Uh, sometimes when people pass, and this is true primarily of many of the masters and advanced souls, they pass out of the body with as great an ease as you could possibly imagine. And they find that they are in the room, are able to clearly see every object in the room as with their physical eyes. They see the people, they hear what the people are saying, and they see their own body laying there, inert and immovable, while they, as though from a position above the body, higher in the room, are gazing down upon it. This is one form of passing. This is a very easy form of passing, you say. But, of course, it is not quite so easy for individuals who experience it this way and don't know they're dead. Because when they do not know that they have passed through, they have the idea that they're in a dream of some kind and they try to wake up. Sometimes they go over to living people and they shake them on the shoulder or they holler in their ears. And it's very disconcerting to them because the people do not answer them, of course. And you know, sometimes if they shake hard enough, the people get a little disturbed and they begin to look around and they, they wonder just what in the world is going on. Now, I am particularly concerned with accidents because accidents are very unusual things. They are not intended to happen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be accidents. And, of course, a lot of people might disagree. They'd say, well, they all function by law and you must have deserved it to have an accident. Perhaps. That's another subject. We'll leave that alone for now. I am concerned with accidents because of the rapidity, almost like a jet, with which the soul is precipitated out of the body into the uh, astral realm and so forth. At that time, individuals really do not know what happened to them and many times there is very little loss of consciousness in accident. I remember one time, several years ago, that on a Sunday afternoon I was driving around Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, as I went out into the country, I met a car coming very fast around the corner and he was on my side of the road heading straight for me. Seven feet in front of my car he veered. Had he not veered I probably would not be here because we would have hit head on and he was doing 70 miles an hour or more, I suspect 80. He veered, lost control, went into the ditch, bounced up on a rock 
went 700 feet in a plowed field and then swung around with four tires blown out. I came up and found a woman who was sitting beside the driver with her teeth all knocked out and uh, a group of children all covered with blood and crying and running around the car and two men there who were drunk, one who was the driver and the other who was in the back seat. Now this is the scene when I came upon it that so amazed me. One young man, the driver, was running around with his hands up in the air like this. And he says, I can't find my body. I can't find my body. I can't find my body. He kept repeating this over and over again. But he was alive. You see? But he had a form of hysteria and he was not really aware of what he was doing. He thought he was in a dream. And the other one was moaning on the ground saying that he had back trouble. He said, my back is killing me. So I got an ambulance, the people were taken away, and they all lived. And the woman got some beautiful bridge work, and I had to go into court afterward to testify in the case. And uh, the woman looked twice as good when I saw her in court as she did when she was in the accident. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So they do patch these cases up. But I wanted to point this out to you because the significant thing here was he kept saying, I cannot find my body. And uh, now, if he had been killed, it's very possible that he could have been running around there doing the very same thing, I can't find my body. Because there was a disconnection of consciousness and yet there was an awareness that he was himself. He knew that he was himself, but he couldn't find his body. Now this is the way sometimes people feel when they pass through transition. Several years ago, one of the great masters spoke through me and founded what is known as the Order of the Golden Lily. This was a spiritual order whose purposes were to have a group of people on the earth plane who would serve and work with accident victims and try to establish some contact with the higher powers of light and assist these beings in getting out of the atmosphere of earth and getting free of what we will call uh, being earth bound. Now, this may seem relatively unimportant to you at this moment because you're very much alive, but if you can apply it to yourself, this is a mighty good insurance policy for the whole human race. If there is a group of people with enough love and devotion to go ahead and think of you after you're gone, as a rule, you know, once you're gone, I mean, you become no more than a statistic and they begin engraving your headstone and they start figuring out how, what they're going to do with your insurance money, and uh, life becomes really uh, very uninteresting as far as you're concerned. You're just out of the picture, and you're soon forgotten whether you think you will be or not. I mean, I'm always amused when I read obituary. They say, the loving mother in memory of so-and-so, because this lasts for a short time, and I have seen it in undertaking parlors where the heirs, including the family, were fighting over their mother's coffin over the money already yet. And this is true. So what we really ought to be interested in is not insurance policies alone of a mundane nature to provide for our family, but we ought to be concerned with spiritual insurance policies, which the masters are, that will provide not only for other people, but for ourselves, that someone is going to take some interest. Now, Elizabeth and I, together with the staff here, do just this kind of work with a lot of our members. We haven't lost many of our members. I'm thankful for that. We've had only a few people that have died in the Summit Lighthouse, and of those, a uh, few of them have ascended. And uh, I was able, fortunately, to assist in a few ascensions. We had an ascension service for one gentleman, during which time he made his ascension during the service. Now, this is a very important activity. And whereas people like to think that they can guarantee their immortality, in reality, there is nothing more important as a guarantee to survival and to adjustment to the other side of life than to have a group of people that understand these laws working for you. Would you like to place your life in the hands of some clergyman who merely says over your remains, dust to dust, ashes to ashes? Or do you want someone that's living and in contact with the masters that work on these interdimensional planes to work for you 
and work to see that you do get taken care of. And that's something that we do with our members. I mean, we work for each member if they notify us by telegraph or by letter, the members of their family, and we do take care of our members after they have passed, which is a very, very important thing at any age because people never know. And we work with the masters on this. And uh, we work to do everything within our power to bring about the comfort of the passing one as well as the remaining people. And I know there's people here that can testify to the truth of this. I think then that today when we're thinking about the resurrection, we also ought to recognize that either we're going to ascend or we're going to have another embodiment. It's like the old story that was told about the man who was going overseas. He was real worried about it and a nervous soldier, he was shaking all over. And so a fellow came up to him and he said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, either you're going to go to POE and go overseas or you won't. It's just two things. And he said, well, that's true. And he says, if you get overseas, he said, either you're going to go to the front line or you won't go to the front line. It's only two things. And he said, even if you go to the front line, he said, either you're going to get killed or you won't get killed. It's only two things. And he said, and even if you get killed, you still have two chances. <laughs> so you see, the thing boils down to that, that you have two chances. And uh, you're either going to ascend or you're going the other route. And if you should go the other route and you miss it this time and you come back, you certainly don't want to be earthbound. You don't want to fall prey to the, any of the denizens of the astral realm. And if you don't think that there are denizens there, I will remind you that most of you have had nightmares at some time in your life. And they are most unpleasant experiences. And I'm telling you right now that nightmares occur when your emotional body, free from the physical body, gets entangled in the psychic or the astral. And that is what is happening to it. Now, only a master or an advanced soul under the direction of a master knows how to cut you free from that type of entanglement once you're out of the body. And in the higher work of the Keepers of the Flame, some of which is not even written yet, as well as the work of the summit, we are providing for this type of service as well as telling you how to live now. So when we say that we try to work for the whole man, we mean just that. And it is a very, very important thing because anyone that understands the astral and understands the psyche and understands the spiritual levels of consciousness knows that no one should in their right mind want to remain bound in the astral realm. I'll tell you something of what you'll find in the astral realm, in the psychic realm. You will find Chinese opium smokers who are out of the body and have their body somewhere in China laid down in an old shed on a pad and they're out there floating around in the astral realm. And if you take a good look at them, you don't want to associate with them. You wouldn't have them in your house here. They came to your door, you'd close the door in a hurry and lock it and call the police. But they can easily get a hold of people when they're in the astral realm and I'm not just kidding you. And they are not, in all cases, going to be benign in their activity. Sometimes these people have a great deal of experience in the astral realm. In fact, they live in the astral more than they do in the physical, and that's why they smoke opium, because they cannot face physical reality, and they live in the astral. There you will find the tools of black magicians. You will find vampire activity. You will find witchcraft. You will find all kinds of things that your pastors in some of the churches may tell you do not exist. Well, don't fool yourself. They exist here on this earth today among the living, and they certainly do exist there. Now, I'm not trying to throw any fear into anybody. I'm trying to tell you today that you need to take preventative measures to protect yourself. And the way to do it is to have the guidance of a master of light from on high. I don't care whether you select Jesus or Master Moria or Archangel Michael or who you tie to. You should have one master specifically that you should affinitize with. You should call to him daily. You should make every attempt to become a friend to that master. You know, I'm going to tell you something. You know very well that even if you wanted to, you couldn't shake hand in a whole lifetime with all the people on this earth, let alone a small portion of them. And so 
I was given a great revelation on life waves, which I'm not going to explain to you, but it's a tremendous thing. It shows the affinities of life and how that people circulate in certain orbits and how they came forth from the great central sun. And it shows how that life is compartmented and a caravan of light moves on and a caravan of being and people stay together life after life with the same people many times. So you have to realize that there is a tremendous activity that you can do to protect yourself by making friends with a, an advanced soul, a very advanced being. You can take one of these masters, this is within the cosmic law, and you can make special calls to that master that you affinitize with. This is called making friends with the master. The masters are very busy. Don't fool yourself on that. They have a lot of people calling to them. And if you never call to them, and you never establish that rapport, where are you? Now I'm going to show you something right now. Mother Mary, of course, is called to by Catholics all over the world. And they have a prayer that they use to uh, establish an affinity with her. The only trouble is that a lot of the people that use it, use it insincerely and repeat it not as a mantra of power to draw her radiance, but they repeat it by rote. And this is what is wrong with decreeing by rote, praying by rote, or doing anything by rote. Actually, of course, if you do a thing by rote with a sincere purpose, eventually you can establish yourself by rote to the point where your subconscious being will take over the prayer, and after a while it gets to be a very real mantra of power, and you can actually draw the light through that mantra, whether or not you realize it at first. But you have to be sincere in order to do this. In other words, even if you were not particularly sincere as far as the decree you were making, in other words, you couldn't put all the thought and feeling you wanted to into it, but you're sincere in your heart that you want to be able to. By just doing the rote over and over and over and intentionally creating sincerity within yourself, you can actually establish sincerity. Do you understand me, what I'm talking about? You have to be sincere because it's like me deciding I'm going to walk up to Alaska. If I decide I'm going to do that, to take all those footsteps, I have to be sincere. And if you're going to make a prayer 3,000 times a day or 6,000 times a day or 12,000 times a day, you have to be pretty sincere, don't you? Right? Well, that's the thing I'm talking about. But, however, by road is not the actual way to do it. You should seek to establish a rapport with the cosmic being. Now, if you take one of these beings and you establish friendship with them, in other words, like this. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. You see what they're doing? They're trying to establish a rapport with Mary. Mary's brought a lot of people through. She's pulled all kinds of people through. But she's not the only one to whom you should call. Actually, it's understandable that heaven should like to be diversified a little bit. Wouldn't it be an awful thing to have everybody call to one being? I'm glad, and I'm sure the masters are too, that some people call to Moria, some to St. Germain, some to Mother Mary, as their special guru. And the masters take you under their wing and they guide you. Now there is a fallacious school of thought in the world that tries to make the statement that you cannot have an ascended master for your guru, that you have to have a living master of flesh and blood. This is absolutely false. And I asked the party one time that told me this, I said, are you trying to tell me that my master Moria L is not living? Well, he thought he could tell me that. But when I asked him if he thought the Lord Jesus was not living, he backed up on that one. He said, no, he's living. You see, so actually when you boil it all down to common sense, these great beings are very real and they're very much alive and they can be your guru. You, of course, have heard it said that when the student is ready, the master will appear. So just remember that you can do an awful lot to bring about that appearance by readying yourself for that appearance when the student is ready. But the student has to make himself ready. The master isn't going to ready the student. After all, the bride has to buy her own dowry and get herself dressed up and put on her finery and prepare to meet her husband. He doesn't even see her many times until they get to the church. So don't you suppose that when we're trying to reunite with our higher self that we have some preparation to make? Now then, to finish up on this thing about death, I want to tell you 
that there are many octaves through which an individual can pass. And the most desirable thing of all is to just rip right through like a rocket, right through these astral realms and psychic realms and get right into the octaves of light. I visited, and I told some of you about it before, several years ago I visited out of the body in a special etheric realm that was prepared for the little children who pass through transition at a very early age. Naturally, these little children can't be taken right back into embodiment very easily. Sometimes they have a waiting period of many, many years or decades. And, of course, life has to be guided by the karmic record and the opportunities for birth. Karmic board has to select a special pattern that fits that life stream. And as far as UNIVAC and IBM and all these organizations, heaven has its own system, but it doesn't make any error. When your card comes up, you go down into the channels of birth, but it has to come up. So in the meantime, you're somewhere. You can't be nowhere in the universe and have life, and you do have eternal life because you have a soul, and the soul is immortal. So I visited this realm, and what I saw was so beautiful. It reminded me almost of a fantastic land because it, it was actually a land floating in the clouds. And it was a little city. And they had a house mother and father in every, it looked like a little army barracks, only they were cottages. And the children had what looked like Elysian fields to play in. The fields were so beautiful, the little rolling hills and knolls. And as far as you could see, there were beautiful clouds there. And the children were running and playing in the field and playing with garlands of flowers and dancing and they all wore little wooden shoes. They had little Dutch shoes on, and they had a cobblestone walk, and the houses looked like something that Walt Disney would create here on this earth. And this was just, just a beautiful thing. And you know, they even have a dinner bell. And they ring this bell, and the children come trooping in from the fields, and they have little trundle beds that they put the children in. And this situation is handled so beautifully on the inner that no parent would ever grieve too, too long over their child if they were able to see the wonderful life that those children have provided for them. And this is true. This is real. The children are actually passed through a period of indoctrination where they're given counseling and they're talked to in a manner they can understand. They're put under the house mother and father and they have their little gatherings around the fire in the evening. They have both twilight and uh, they have everything that we have here on earth they try to make the environment very beautiful. It's very much like, uh, well, you remember Tinkerbell the fairy? You remember that little story? Uh, what's the name of that story now? Uh, Peter Pan, Mary Martin played in. Well, actually, it's very much like Peter Pan, only there's no pirates or bad people in it, no characters, nothing miserable. Everything is on a very high level of beauty. This is an etheric city. And there are many of them to receive these beautiful little souls as they come up. And uh, after they're there so many years, when the time for birth comes, rebirth again, they're taken to another place and they're given special training in preparation for birth. And in regard to the unspoken question from the audience, do they age? They do not age there. They remain the same age as they were when they go there. You understand? I mean, they stay just steady. If they're eight years old, they stay eight years old because there's no purpose in running through an aging cycle. And so they don't start it, because then they wouldn't be chosen. So I want you all to understand that we are safer in the hands of God if we can get through the astral belt that is actually a replica of the earth modes intensified by the human viciousness of human thought and feeling. In other words, once we pass through the psychic belt, and get into the higher reaches, then the purposes of Eden are served. Their life is beautiful. The miserable portions of life all exist on the earth planet itself and in the astral level. These are the things that we should shun. And this is why our work is important, because it not only frees you today, but it frees you for a time that is approaching for everyone from the moment they're born. The moment they're born, they begin to deteriorate to a degree unless they can uh, renew their life eternally. This is possible to a certain degree. Some of you are probably aware of Shiva Puri Baba, 
the Indian who uh, lived to be 139 in one body. However, the average life cycle should be 144 years. But this is not usually, of course, accomplished, but only half of that and sometimes less. But Shiva Puri Baba at 90 looked as young as Michael Wilson with his black beard. And he had a beard like that and snapping brown eyes. At 90, he looked that young and he had that kind of a face. At 120, he looked like a man of about 55. But when he was 137, and I have his picture here, when he was 137, just the day before he died, he was photographed and his hair was snow white, his cheeks were sunken in, and his eyes were fixed on God. You could see that he was already behind the veil in thought. So then, we see that the mysteries of life are compounded very much and they're very intricate and yet truth is stranger than fiction. But fear is one of the things that causes people to tremble because we always fear the unknown. We need not, of course, fear the unknown. But the argument that men always advance is, well, no one has ever gone there and come back. This is ridiculous. We've all been there and we have soul memory and some of us can remember. I could tell you some very interesting stories from my own life. I don't wish to take up your time. I think we should get on now with a, sing a song, one song. Then we will have the meditation music for the keeper of the flame dictation by the unknown master. I hope that you have received some benefit from our dissertation this afternoon.